Welcome to Steps, a podcast celebrating people and their stories. Far too often, we don't give people the opportunity to share their journey, where they've come from, what they've overcome, and the amazing things that have happened in their lives. That's what we're going to do on Steps. We'll have real conversations with real people to understand how they've gotten to this place in time. Confucius said, the journey of 1,000 miles starts with a single step. So, let's start this journey. Today's guest on Steps is Sydney Moore. Sydney, to me, is one of the most inspiring people that I've had a chance to speak with on Steps. She's an amazing human who happens to be a Division I college volleyball player, an advocate and mentor with Viz, Voice and Sport, and an SB Award winner for the impact that she's had on this world. I hope that you are as inspired by this conversation with Sydney as I was. Now, let's hop into the conversation with Sydney. Well, hello there, my friend. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Oh, I am amazing. The real question that I want to know and that everybody here wants to know is, where in the world right now is Sydney Moore? Um, well, that's different every day. Right now, I'm in, <laughs> in New York. I just set up my first college apartment. Uh, sitting in my bedroom. It's like 89 degrees, super muggy in Ithaca, but I'm happy to be settled. Wait, so please tell me it's not 89 degrees in your apartment. It's 89 degrees in Ithaca and the window's open. So maybe like 85 in my room. We don't have... Nope. (laughs) Oh, we need... (laughs) Well, we're done here. We got to get on Amazon and we got to find you a window air conditioner. (laughs) Yeah, I I got to set one of those out. Yeah, you do. Well, and again, it's it's interesting, right? Ithaca, New York, and there's kind of this parallel um, and how we actually got connected. I'll kind of connect the dots for everybody that doesn't know. So my first guest ever on Steps was my good friend, Matt Ginepro. And uh, in his journey, he talked about what happened at App State when he was a head coach. And he was, you know, he left App State and was trying to figure out life and all that stuff. And Lo and behold, my dear friend ends up out in Ithaca, New York, as well as the associate head coach out at Cornell. And that's how we got connected. So um, I don't know, like what I'm going to throw you for a loop here, but like Matt's new, right? Matt's a new coach to you and your organization, everything like that. But like how, because I know he's infectious. Tell me about Matt and like your, uh, your thoughts about him and kind of your quick interactions with him. Matt's been awesome, I think. I mean, I've said this before, and I'm sure he knows it. Like, when he's my, like, fourth, I think my fourth head coach, that, like, assistant head coach that's come since me being at Cornell, and I'm only going to be a junior, and that's just how things go sometimes, right? Um, But when he came, I was, like, a little nervous because you never know. Sometimes you strike gold. Sometimes you you don't so much, and I've been lucky. But, you know, just having another head coach was, you know, uh, another coach was exciting, and uh, interesting for everyone. And Matt's been awesome. He's like started up right away with the vulnerability and talking about himself, asking like the real questions about you, not just, you know, what position are you? Where are you from? Hmm. How are you doing? What are you studying today? You know, and he has a psychology background. I'm a psych major. So we really love to talk about that. We can connect on that in a lot of ways. So it's been really awesome. I'm excited for the fall. We had a great spring, so I can't wait to get to know him better and be a player. Yeah, that's like, that's rad because again, like that's what I hear. And again, you know, this many people do, if you're just tuning in, right. I was a college volleyball coach prior to going and working for Adidas and then where I'm at right now, but like coach, you don't get that a lot with coaches. Coaches aren't necessarily, like you said, coaches aren't coming in and asking, Hey, how are you doing? And then truly meaning it and wanting to hear, oh, well, (laughs) school has just blasted me right now and I'm overwhelmed. uh, Okay, great. Well, hey, we need you to go ahead and pass 50 balls against the wall. No, like, and I think that's really refreshing to hear that Matt's doing that and then also kind of being vulnerable and living what's up to him. I love it. Like, that's huge. Yeah, it's awesome. Like, you can't really ask for more from a coach. No, you cannot. And I love that. Um, so now that we've now that I've fangirled all over Matt, you know, and you know, made him know how much how much I appreciate him and how awesome he is. Um, you mentioned like two years at Cornell and going into your junior year, but what I want to do, like, I want to rewind because again, you're you're at an Ivy League school, you're like all of these things, right? 
but that's not a, yeah. like that's where you're at currently. I want I want to talk about kind of the journey and where you started and kind of that progress and what's led you to this moment in time. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it all starts in Missouri. I've never lived in Missouri, but but both my parents are from Missouri, um, Kansas City and St. Louis. And a lot of our family still lives out there. I spend, you know, summers and Christmas out there a lot of the time. Um, and, I, and I think it starts with that. Both of my parents played college sports, um, football and basketball um, and athletics. It's just always been a part of our family. Um, that and just the importance of education and, and learning um learning to to better yourself, learning about your rights, all of that kind of stuff. Um, My grandma was a history teacher and she taught me everything I know in in terms of civil rights, all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, she's probably the most excited about where I'm at right now. Um, I was, yeah, right. Uh, I was born in Pennsylvania, um, around five years old. I moved to, uh, we lived in Chicago for a little bit when my mom went back and got her MBA. Grew, like really grew up in New Jersey from five to about 16 years old, mm-hmm. um, went to high school for two years there and then moved to, to California, to San Diego, where I live now. Um, and throughout all of that, I, I was playing sports uh, from really young. I played everything, soccer, softball. I ice skated for a while. I convinced my parents to let me do dance. I was a cheerleader. Uh, yeah. I swam. I swam. I think the only sport I didn't do was lacrosse. Um, so maybe you'll, maybe I'll talk to some of my friends on the team. I was going to say you, you're in the, you're in the perfect spot for it right now. So that's, (laughs) that's awesome. Well, Um, what I, what I love hearing, what I love hearing is that you did so many things, right? You tried a whole bunch of stuff on because that's not typically what happens these days. That's not like it's, Hey, specialize at age 11 and we need you. And I'm speaking mostly volleyball because that's what I know, but like, Hey, we need you you're, oh, guess what? You're 11 years old. You need to be training this. And you're the only thing you can do. Whereas the best athletes and the most well-rounded people that I've come across and that have a good grasp on things have dabbled and done things because again, you know, I want to go back to like your dance and cheer and all of that stuff. Now for everybody that, you know, is watching you're sitting down, but like, how tall are you? I'm like 5'11", 6 foot. It changes every time I go to the doctor. Yeah, yeah. So again, and I want to kind of, that as a frame of reference, right? When you're a kid, and again, I've got a daughter. My daughter's not even six years old yet, and she's four foot two inches tall, right? Like, so I'd imagine you're kind of going through this, and as a kid, you're trying on a whole bunch of different stuff and learning how to move and how all this stuff. Like, how did that, can you talk to me a little bit about that? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was funny. You we look at the pictures of me and cheer and I'm like a foot and a half taller than everyone, like automatically the back spot. Um, and I think doing some of those things too, showed me like, okay, what I wasn't interested in. Like I was not interested in softball, New Jersey's, especially where I live. We were in very close to a lake, the mosquitoes, dragonflies. That wasn't my, that wasn't my area. Um, but I would say even with basketball, I was always really tall and really skinny for a really long time even yeah. up until high school. And it was a struggle for me to, I was always quick and I was fast and that's how I was able to do well. Um, But I always kind of got pigeonholed into the the big position, right? Until you start playing with the really, really big girls. And like you were saying with specializing, what's so sad right now, it's like, it's not even specialized in your sport, it's specialized in a position. Mm -hmm. 100%. When I started playing playing volleyball, it was middle, 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 middle. You're going to learn how to block. And honestly, they weren't really worried about my hitting. I just learned how to block. And it's definitely worked to my advantage now having all of that extra extra coaching, but it took a really long time for me to get those ball handling and other skills and uh, take myself out of, out of that hole and show people what I could do outside of volleyball, outside of sports, all, all of that. Well, it's interesting, right? Because again, I've coached a club many ages, like the youngest I've coached is 12, right? And again, to what you're saying, Many people are out there. Hey, you're tall. I need you go be big, right? Oh, or you're mm-hmm. like you're short and you've got good ball control. You're the libero, right? Like, and it it just happens so quickly. Whereas, in my opinion, again, I think the more well rounded that each person can be athletically, personally, and all that stuff, like the better human they're going to be. Because again, as we know, right. life is much more than sport, and sport is something that is imp- impactful and empowering within while you're playing it. But like. And we need to figure out how to not be identified with, hey, you're tall, you're a middle. 
Hey, you're, right. f- you're fast. You should run track. Like, no, like there's, we're so much more than that, but off on my tangent. Um, so you did all these different things mm-hmm. and again, we know that you're playing volleyball at Cornell, but was the like, was volleyball where, how did volleyball come about? And then what were you doing uh, leading up to that? Oh, there was like a very specific, like, I don't know, someone, someone came, chose chose that for me. That was like divine intervention, whatever you believe in that was planned because girl, my mom played volleyball um, growing up and she ended up playing basketball in college and and professionally. Um, But I played basketball my whole life. I wanted to, to be like my mom. I wanted, I wanted to be like Lisa Leslie. I wanted to be like Don Staley. Like I wanted to play basketball. um, And that, that was my dream. And I played probably, I played competitively in a club from second grade until sophomore year. So of high school. So I would say around third, fourth grade, we're actually traveling across the country every other weekend or so playing in these huge Nike Adidas, you know, like tournaments, EYBL and all that kind of stuff. Um, And it was extremely competitive and I liked it for a really long time. Um, And then I kind of had to get away from, I couldn't play for my town league anymore. I couldn't play for my high school league anymore, middle school or whatever it was. I was missing out on a lot. Um, And then on top of that, I think some of the the pressure uh, of being this little mini pro athlete um, took a lot of my, my love for the sport. And I think some of that love for the sport was based off some of those, uh, external factors right of, of all the cool gear we're getting sent and mm-hmm. thinking about playing in these schools um and so when i went into high school my freshman year there was a girl that i used to play against that played basketball and she was going to go to that high school too so we were talking about the basketball there and summer league and all these things and she played volleyball she played both so she was really great and her mom convinced me somehow to go to the open gym <laughs> and i did and and our head coach maria nolan um, at IHA in, in Washington Township, New Jersey. She taught me volleyball. She gave me my first volleyball. I still have it today um, from the gym. And uh, she taught me how to pass, gave me like very, very simple hitting lessons, yeah. <laughs> like as as elementary as he could. And I left that day and I loved it. And I don't think I ever was so obsessed or excited about something in my life. I like watched every volleyball game I could on YouTube, every you know, art of coaching and masters and all those mm-hmm. videos. And that's how volleyball started. Um, when I was, a uh, that year I ended up trying out for the team at IHA, uh, in aug- early August. Um, I made JV, uh, which we were all so excited about. We didn't think I was going to make it at all because right. IHA was actually a powerhouse in New Jersey. Yeah. Um, I got, ended up getting pulled up that year. Some, a girl got hurt. And they were going to Maryland. They needed another girl, and I was a blocker. You know, I, I was really lucky to be athletic. I had decent court awareness. I understood defense because of my basketball background. Mm-hmm. And they pulled me up, and I went to Maryland. And you know, I, I meshed well with the girls. I was a good teammate. I I think I played pretty well for then. And I ended up being on the varsity squad for most of the year, um, doing kind of JV and varsity. And we ended up winning state. And uh, we won state that year, and that was actually our tenth straight state title for IHA volleyball. Yo. So decade called it decade of dominance. Um, so that was exciting, right? So there was like a whole chain of events there where I had this really awesome basketball career. I was introduced to this passion project, right? But then I also was able to have a really successful volleyball experience. Um, so from that, I, I kept playing. They told me, you know. You, if you want to keep playing next year, you're probably going to have to play club. You have to be better next mm-hmm. year. There's going to be more competition. So I did club in AAU. Uh, doing club in AAU or like club in high school basketball was a lot because I was also kind of playing varsity basketball. Um, we were going to the state tournament for basketball oh, too. Like I got really lucky with my high schools. We were we were all my high schools. We were dominant in the sports. We were, we were great academic schools as well. Um, we were dominant in the sports and. It just was a struggle playing club and, and doing basketball. I realized it wasn't going to be able to be maintained. At that point, I felt like basketball was starting to show, you know, all of the, the years of work were starting to, to show, um, getting some basic recruiting, right? Freshman year, you can't really get a whole lot right. with the recruiting rules. 
invitations to camp, conversations from coaches. Like I was kind of getting an idea of what level of play I could I could get to, and, and it sounded great. Um, I had a, one school in mind that I just really loved. That was like my dream school always. I went to camp. I had a great experience with the coaches. I knew that if I kept playing, you know, get a little bit better, that it was it was looking really good for me. And I looked, you know, I looked inward and I was like, you know what? I'm not really excited about this. Like, I'm excited about volleyball, right? When you're spending the whole day playing basketball and you meet your dream coach and you go home to the dorms that night and you're looking at volleyball, you know that that there's got to be something else, right? So I started, I quit that year and I played volleyball. And uh, I'm definitely making it sound a lot easier than it was. It was extremely <laughs> hard. Yeah. Um, I think. One, just that's that was my identity, right? Sydney, the basketball player, like, and I think especially too from my mom playing, um, doing really really well at Northwestern, um, and playing pro and having been a coach for so long and all those different things for me, um, that was definitely a part of who I thought I was. And then beyond that, I think when you, I'm sure we'll talk about Title Nine later, but just thinking about your opportunities. Mm-hmm as an athlete, your college opportunities, you know, glimmering locker rooms, full scholarships, like all the different things that you can get out of being an athlete at a high level. That was something I was risking. I I wasn't good at volleyball. (laughs) Like I I was okay, you know, but I wasn't at, I wasn't at a level comparable to where I was at basketball yet. Not yet. And it took a lot. I mean, there's so much to unpack there. Like, and again, you like, (laughs) I mean, I want to rewind to, because you mentioned people you wanted to be like. You mentioned Lisa Leslie. Right. You mentioned Don Staley. You mentioned your mom, right? Like you had these strong female role models that, again, we'll get, we'll get, to, we'll talk more about that a little bit later too. But like these are people that you're aspiring to do and follow in their footsteps. And there comes a point in time to where your desire to follow the, in their footsteps gets trumped by an internal reflection and you assessing happiness and that, and like, that's, I want to talk more about that because that's something that, again, you're talking freshman, sophomore year. So you're talking what, 14, 15 years old, right? Like 14 and 15 years old, like I've coached that age. I like, that's not looking inward and reflecting and looking at happiness is not something that typically lands on the radar of a 14 or 15 year old. And I want to understand how you like, how you came to that conclusion or what that reflection looked like. If you like, if you have the ability to kind of go back to that or what caused you to start thinking like that. Right. I mean, I think if I'm going to be completely honest, the decision came um, wildly from privilege. I was privileged enough not to, my going to college wasn't reliant on me getting an athletic scholarship. Mm. was where, when I look back, like my mom, you know, Northwestern, you know, all of that, she says it all the time, that wouldn't have happened without one Title IX and, and two without her athletic ability and, and the hard work that she did put in, but also, you know, all of that. And so that was one thing I, I can't, be remiss to ask, especially when I talk to athletes about these kind of decisions, because sports does give you a pathway to do a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was really lucky there. And two, um, I think it was one of the things that I remember hearing in in basketball and, and while I was playing, especially these high level teams was like, you know, 18 months until you're in high school, 18 months until varsity tryouts, six months until state final, four years until college, five years into NCAA championship, you know, three years until you're pro, like all of these things. And (laughs) I remember in maybe the last six months to year of me playing basketball, I was like, oh God, like I do not, I don't think I can make it. I don't think I can make it another six months, like forget four years. I was like, I don't think I could do this for another four years of high school. Forget four years of college. Definitely couldn't go pro. I was burnt out. My love for the sport was gone. And I can't say if that was, I, I, can't, I can't say for sure if that was coaching or the program or just basketball in general. How long did, um, how long were but, you, play, how long were you playing basketball for up at, like, when did you start? I started as soon as I could. It's probably like four or five, like in 
you know, rec and playing with my parents. Yeah. Um, started playing for travel teams in second grade and then started playing like, ser- like that's like playing town, like town to town, yeah. um, like a championship at the end. And then like traveling, like flying and big tournaments, your name in brochures and pamphlets, fifth grade. Wow. And, and I loved it. And, and I know some people, they definitely have, that's a thing that I talk about with my parents now is parents sometimes push their kids to do it mm-hmm. because they're like, Oh, you could go, you could go to college. You could get your college paid for. This is our investment. You could go pro, especially for boys. When you think about um, like these, some of these prep schools and NBA and mm-hmm. all of that, there's like an investment. I wanted to do it. I was like, I want to play travel. I want to play middle school. I want to play AAU. I'm going to be the best. Like, this is going to be great. And it was until it wasn't, it was really great. But and so it wasn't. And I had to be aware of that it wasn't. Um, and that's, I think, why I was open to the volleyball thing. Whereas in the past, when my parents had tried to get me to play volleyball or even other sports more competitively and really, really do them and, and really grow and try them out, I was always like, no, that's going to distract me from basketball or no, I have to do this the best. I have to be the best here. Um, I wasn't really open. I was always open academically. Um, I think I was always aware of like either getting hurt or the pressure put on my body and stuff like that. Was there like, was it just like, because again, you said you loved it and then you walked away from it. Like was, I'm trying to understand because again, I also know that we, I'm fortunate enough that the people that listen to this, right. It's a broad mix of people. I mean, I've got parents that have reached out to me and they've shared episodes with their daughters and stuff like that. So like, I want to make sure that we're not kind of going brushing over this because like, that's a very, that's a mm-hmm. big thing. And like to sit and again, I applaud your parents for listening to you when you said like, look, this isn't it. But like, how did you come to that full decision to be like, no, this isn't it. And again, I know you said the opportunities and all that, but like, was it like a switch or was it just like, you like I'm done. Yeah. It definitely wasn't a switch. And I think up until probably, honestly, my soft, like my sophomore year, my first actual rookie year of playing in college, I was nervous about it and wondered, did I mess up? Did I ruin my life? Did I make the, you know, two paths diverge in a yellow wood? Like, did I choose the wrong one? Like, that was a very, I was very aware of that. Um, and I would say one was the I, the fact that I was just, I was so passionate about volleyball and I knew that I did want to play in college. And I think I did have, I had the coaching and the resources that if I, if anyone wants to play in college, there is a program for them. So like, I can't promise that everyone's going to be able to play division one, two, three. I can't promise that everyone's going to play like at their top school, but if there's a program you're going to be able to go, you're going to be able to play. And at the very least, you'll be able to play club. So that was something I knew. And I loved volleyball so much that I knew that I would be okay with that if that's how it turned out. But I also did have a good amount of, like I knew a good amount of confidence that I would be able to play in college. I wasn't exactly sure D1 or what, but I knew I'd be able to play in college. Um, I knew that I would have the coaching and I had even just the passion to find those resources for myself and be able to play. Um, and then for basketball, it was, it, it was a self-fulfillment situation. It was, am I playing basketball for myself now mm-hmm. or am I playing for other, other people and what other people might think every time that I thought about basketball versus volleyball, when I thought about volleyball, I was like, Oh, that was so fun. Like remember running onto the court, remember looking at that newspaper, remember your first, you know, getting the ball and, and all these different things. I wanted to talk volleyball strategy. I thought about basketball. Oh, I can still sit down and be like, oh, she didn't cut hard enough. She should have passed with her right hand. These things, like I know basketball, that's in me, but I wasn't excited about it. I wasn't seeking out new information. I wasn't trying to get better. And I think that's what makes great athletes when we talk about, you know, like these amazing 1% athletes. It's not just like that these are these freaks of nature. They're trying to get better. They have a passion for the sport that pushes them to continue to play. So I may have been a great basketball player, but I wouldn't have been phenomenal because, and that's not the only goal, but I wouldn't have been phenomenal because I didn't have a passion to get better. At that point I was going to practice and I was doing the drill because I had to do the drill. I'm thinking in practice, okay, two hours, Hmm. one and a half hours, one hour, 
like, you know, and, and it, it just, I wasn't fulfilled by it. I wasn't excited by it. And every time I thought about staying, I thought about, oh, you know, this coach put so much time and effort into me playing or my parents spent so much money each year on club, you know, to make, you know, this was an investment. Like I have to make, you know, well, if I do volleyball, I have to make sure that I get a scholarship so I can like, you know, fulfill the investment that mm-hmm. everyone put on me. Um, but I was really lucky to have people in my life that were like, your value isn't just based off you being an athlete. <laughs> You know, like we'll still love you if you don't play a sport in college. If you don't play a sport, say that. I want you to say that. I want you to say that again. And I, I wrote that down because that, that is something that we need to keep talking about. Say that again about value. If we'll still love you if if you don't play a sport in college, if you're not an athlete, if you never play sport again, like we'll still love you. Um, And that was very hard for me. And now that's still hard for me. When I think, when I play, when when I don't do well, when I'm not an all I all Ivy, I don't get honorable mention. I'm not leading the team in kills that day. Whatever it is, that's still um, a, have been a still been a hard thing for me to to do because I think I have had my identity so much in in sports yeah. and success, and I've been surrounded by these crazy teams where I've almost been warped yeah. <laughs> on how good I am because I'm around national champions and. My best friend, one of my best friends is an Under Armour All-American. Like, I've been warped a little bit. 100%, right? And again, what I hear, and you said this before, your identity was Sydney, the basketball player, right? And again, it just because right. you drop basketball doesn't mean it's that easy to drop the identity piece, right? So now are you Sydney, the volleyball player? At times, I'm sure that pops into your head, and you've said that, right? You still hold on to it. Like, your identity is wrapped into, you know, a little bit being an athlete right now. And I think that's part of the challenge that we come across across the country, right? Go sport agnostic. Like it doesn't matter. Like these kids, and again, I'm going to call you a kid just by dating myself. Right. But like you are, and, but kids and even adults and everybody, like our identity gets wrapped up in all this, this preconceived notion and what other people think about us. And and like, you are so much more than an athlete. And we're going to talk about like, all of the things that you've done by virtue of the platform of being an athlete, because I, I don't want to look, like blow past that because if you're able to utilize your platform and what, you know, the gifts that God and the universe have given to you for other things outside of just being an athlete, right. Then is that even more fulfilling of your purpose? And like, so like, that, like that's a totally different thing, but like yeah. the identity and the self-fulfillment thing, like that's, so many people get wrapped up in it. And I'm going to say coaches too, right? Like I've said this on different podcasts that I, like I've, in interviews and stuff, like I'm Steve Venzel. I'm a husband and I'm a father. Well, I need to be able to, what I, what my goal is to continue to lead with that. But when I was a coach or like in society, right? Like, hey, what do you do? And we lead with what is our job as opposed to like, who are you yeah. at your core and who, what do you stand for? And what are those, you know, those values and everything like that? Like it's, Oh, I get fired up about that stuff because again, it's, it, it's so prevalent right now. It's such a common thing. And I think even like, I'll say among students or athletes, like I go to an Ivy league school, it's like, Oh, what do your parents do? <laughs> and you're like, wow. Okay. You're like, hi, I'm Sydney. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I've played volleyball. Like, I'm a psych major, like all these different things. Um, and so much is wrapped up in that external identity. I think people forget. There was, internal stuff and that's been something I've been there was a book on. that i read and again i because you talked the ivy league and all this uh what made maddie run um i, I may be butchering the title it's a, a runner uh where was she pen i believe and she took her own life uh after her freshman year oh. of her or first semester of her freshman year but again from an identity and from all of these different things like the perception that as the, as the biography, it was done by Kate Fagan. Um, I'll throw a link into it, into the show notes for anybody that wants to read it. Like it's a tremendous read and offers insight to like the mind of what these athletes and what people are going through from an identity perspective. But you're absolutely right, right? Like, you know, that's the first, one of the things that, well, you know, what are you doing here? Like at Penn, like if you're not high achieving and you're not doing this, this, and this, like, you know, it's very easy for people to feel less than, and that's not just Ivy league, right? That's the life, but that's just the, you know, the yeah. example that you just gave. Yeah, it, it's true. I mean, I remember my 
freshman year going into spring, I'm looking around. I was a, I'm a psych major. My focus is um, behavioral and evolutionary neuroscience. And I am on a pre-med track because I'm interested in the body. Not so much necessarily right now that I know yeah. that I want to be a physician. But I remember I, I actually didn't add that pre-med track until after into my spring because I looked at my final my first year at school I'm at Cornell and I'm looking at all these people who are founders of companies and traveling to Silicon Valley every weekend and you know or you know that cured cancer but it's like you actually are in a cancer research lab or like there's yeah. all of these crazy things and I look at my friend I'm like hey she's in the hotel school she's guaranteed this salary he's in business he's guaranteed these companies like you can't help but look at yourself and think that you're doing something wrong. Um, you can't help but look, you know, in track. I remember you're like, oh, don't look mm -hmm. to the left or to the right when you run, especially at towards Eyes the finish ahead. line. You yeah. just have to run to your own finish line. Eyes ahead. And and that's super hard. Um, and I want to say to anyone, like, it's not just because I'm at an Ivy League mm -hmm. school. It's not just because I'm a Division One athlete. And I'm sure we'll talk about this, but that's a big thing for me. Um, with my the, the girls that I mentor, or people that I talk to, is like if you're feeling some way, then that matters, and that's important. If this is your experience, it matters. It doesn't matter what level you're on. Like I meet people, especially now, and I tell them I play volleyball in, in college, and they're like, "Oh, I played." You know, it'll be an older person. Oh, I played in high school. It doesn't matter. It does matter, you know. Or like, oh, I, I you know, that's so cool. You played at this club. Oh, I played at this one. Like we weren't in open. Yeah. It still matters, and. There's a quote, there's a stat that I have that I love that I tell, especially the girls, 6% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women. 90% of those women played sports at some time in their life. That's huge. And 50% 50, 50 of them played in, in college. But if you just look at that 90%, it just points out all of the mm -hmm. benefits of sport and all the things that there can be to learn. Um, and people talk about all the time, the discipline, physical fitness, like working, like working hard, getting through adversity. But one of the biggest ones for me is, is community. It's self-confidence. It's humility. I spent a lot of time on the bench, like, especially with volleyball a lot. I think I've played 10, 10 seasons of volleyball, com like competitive volleyball. And I would say I've probably spent seven and a half to eight of them mostly on the bench <laughs> like, and it but it's to say like but when we think about it and I, I could say that to someone and they could be like wow she really sucks and she needs to give right. me a fashion when i look back it's like i played against two of the best middles in the country and i'm gonna shout them out lindsey miller layla blackwell and you can disagree with me but they were the two best yeah. middles in the country for a long period of time and lindsey miller one of my best friends is still one of my favorite like i say she's my favorite middle blocker um, we talk about volleyball all the time. She made me, you know, her and Layla made me so much better. Um, the outsides, the middles, this, the, everyone I was playing with during club was insane. Like, so to look back and say, oh, I'm not a good volleyball player is just, it would, I would be, I would be wrong to say that, right? I wouldn't be and, where I am if so, I was. Yeah, and so, so many people, people fall into that though, right? Like, and that's, so and, and, yeah, right. I think that's a perfect segue because like, I want to talk the transition because again, you're in New Jersey, you're playing for a great high school, right? And again, I've coached collegially. I, club up in New Jersey is okay, right? Like, and again, it be, it, I, it's okay, yeah. right? But there's, there's this shift and I wanted to, I wanted to dig in on that because you basically, transition right. from okay volleyball to basically the best, some of the best volleyball in the country. And as you're learning the sport right. and trying to kind of figure out your identity within the sport and all that stuff. So like, can you talk to me about going across the country? <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So I think this is a super fun anecdote. Um, and it's something I would never admit to the girls that I played with because it's can like, it just shows. I remember sophomore year of high school, freshman or sophomore year of high school, me and my best friend, we used to sit like on this balcony in our gym and watch, like I told you, I loved volleyball, watching volleyball videos. That year, Lexi Sun won Gatorade mm -hmm. player of the year. And she played at a club that I ended up playing for and I just remember sitting there and being like, she is insane. Like this girl is so good. And then 
I think some of her club clips were there. And so it's just like all of these girls that she's playing with. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, this is why it's so hard for us to get recruited. Like we need to practice like them. This is insane. Fast forward maybe four or five months. And my mom's like, we're moving to San Diego. And I'm like, (laughs) no way. I'm like, oh my gosh, no way. And so then we're like thinking about what high school to go to. And I end up going to Cathedral Catholic. I need, we were moving. We didn't know exactly where I was going to move. Needed to go to a, a, a private school because we don't want to, you know, go, me have me going sure. to some school and then we move and then I can't go there anymore. We needed some, some level of consistency when you, and so get to Cathedral once again, my team, my my junior year cathedral team, we competed with Tory Pines for CIF final. That was arguably mm-hmm. the national championship. My senior year, we were, we uh, won Durango Fall Classic. That's over a in big Vegas yep. tournament out in Las Vegas. We won um, number one in the country for about a month. Like it was insane. Like, like our high school, it had that. Like some of the volleyball community within Southern California had that same college vibe of like you know all of the players, you know their stats, like everyone knows how you played the night before. Like mm-hmm. at least that's how it felt for, for us at the time. But from, you know, six months ahead, like six months ago, looking at the videos of these girls and being like, they like what they like, how are they so good? How do they train yeah. to actually being there? It humbled me in like the <laughs> craziest way. I, I, I can look back now and laugh and smile, but I was in a, a really, really bad headspace my junior year of how I think all, and that's where I say, you know, I questioned my decision Got it. of basketball, right? And I, um, and I questioned my ability to play volleyball. And I look back and I feel really bad for that, that Sydney, because if she could have put her head up and actually looked at where she was, I don't think I would have been quite as sad. And I think that unhappiness would have been a little bit lessened because I look at it, I looked at it then and I thought I'm the worst on the team. You know, I'd never get into a game. I can barely get into scrimmages and practice. I'm never going to get picked up by a club, forget going to college. Like I, you know, I'm getting roofed every time I hit, I can't tip anywhere. None of my hits are working. I don't jump high enough. I don't have, at that point I bar- I had no ball control, yeah. um, You can, like zero ball control. Like I, I wasn't great, but I was good. And I know that I was good now because I made the team. Yeah. Like how many, you know, how many girls, we're at tryouts. That yeah, didn't and, make and team. again, it's what I as I like. I'm zooming out on that, right? Like, there's a lot to unpack, but like, it's almost like you manifested the environment that you put yourself into. And again, I'm big into talking about that kind of stuff and understanding, yeah. like, look where our, where our thoughts go. You know, we go in many cases, right? We had that. That's the power of the mind. So, like, here you are sitting in the gym looking at Lexi's son, you know, again, she's playing at Nebraska or she just graduated. I believe Um, she was at Nebraska. I mean, again, I remember when I was coaching collegiately, like, I mean, everybody knew Lexi and playing out of coast and all that stuff. But I want to like, you manifested the environment that you got yourself into and then it was tough on you and it it created. And can we, can we talk a little bit more about that? Right. Because again, like it's what you asked for, and then here you are going, oh my gosh, like, what is going on? Yeah, I, I think it goes back to into me seeing my value as me as a volleyball player. Um, like to be as vulnerable as possible. I just remember feeling like, you know, I am putting up maybe one kill in scrimmage during practice. Maybe, you know, I'm getting some touches. Blocking has always been a good skill for me, but, you know, I'm not doing well, right? And I'm new here. No one knows me. Um, I would say, like, everyone was cool. A a lot of us were friends, but when you're playing volleyball on that competitive of a level, there's competition, right? And and people are aware of, you know, the space that's being used mm-hmm. or, your, you know, the names that are being used. Like people are very aware of that. And um, in high school as well, you're prepping for your club right. experience. So what club is going, you know, how you're going to try out for club and, and all of that kind of stuff, what coaches think about you. So um, that was extremely hard for me. And 
it was cool because I went into cathedral as a new student with um, people that knew me. And that's when I, I met Lindsay mm-hmm. and some of my, Nicole, her sister, and some of my good friends. And so that was good. But then also I'm not playing, you know, people don't really know me. And I have this feeling of everyone mm. thinks I suck, right? <laughs> it's like, I'm this girl from New Jersey and, you know, New Jersey, you know, San Diego's a lot cooler than New Jersey, right? And this girl from New Jersey, I, you know, I was a bit of a nerd. I was in like Model UN and I ran for student, like in New Jersey, I was class president. Yeah. Like I thought that stuff was cool. A lot of people didn't think that was that cool. <laughs> so so there was like the act- the academic things. And I, I'll say a lot of the unhappiness I was having um, in volleyball, which is at no one's fault, right? I can't get upset that people were more skilled or that were, you know, our mm-hmm. coaches are coaching to win, right? That's sports. But I took, I think, a lot of that feeling of not being enough into me making friends my first year. And that took a while for me to get used to it and build the confidence. But that's why I also say that sports can be so powerful because I did go through that, you know, I made that shift from big fish, little pond to mm. you know, minnow in ocean <laughs> and, and, and I grew from that. And I became a much better volleyball player. And um, a lot of coaches actually, you know, said like, yeah, like I look at you now, like you're, you know, you're a pretty humble player, right? Like, you know, your role and, and especially on a college level, that's really important to, to know your role and to know what you're good at. So that's something that taught that, that, that experience taught me as well was realizing what I was good at. So I was like, okay, I can't really hit against, you know, these girls yep. yet, but I can block them. So I'm just going to work on blocking. Right. Or I also mm. learned my voice. It was very hard for me my junior year to talk about anything. I still didn't know the positions on the court. I didn't know one, two, three, four, five, six. Like I didn't know what a lot of these, you know, I didn't, what's a bicycle, what's a gap. Like I didn't know a lot of these terminology because I lacked volleyball court awareness sure. and also because I'm in a new region and I didn't speak. And a big moment for me, my senior year uh, at, uh, at one of the tournaments that we won, I, our, we like our biggest hitter. She's phenomenal. She's still killing it. And I'm like, oh, she can tip. Like, this is game point. We need to win. Like, everyone knows she's going to hit. I'm like, she should tip. And I tell her, hey, you should tip. And uh, it doesn't really happen yet in the game. And at the end point, it's like game point, And I'm like, tip. And I'm confident. And I'm talking. And we win. And she tips. And we win. And, like, that was, like, bigger that was like the photo of me I, I wish i could find it like the photo of me is so happy and i know everyone else is like oh we won and we're you know this is crazy we just won this tournament and for me it's like you were right <laughs> it's like you understand volleyball and like you oh deserve God. to be here and like you did it and and i just remember for the rest of that season like people brought up like oh didn't sydney tell you to do that she's like yeah sydney told me to do that we won and i was just like i found my voice i felt like you know a lot of the state championship, I won two state championships in high school. And I, I feel bad to say mm. this. I didn't feel like I won them when we won. I didn't feel like I won them because I, I wasn't on the core. I didn't feel like I was, um, a lot of people talk about like, oh, if, even if you're right. a practice player, you're putting up competition. But I was still so new and raw that I didn't really feel like I was helping anyone. Yeah. You know, for a long time, I felt like I was kind of just taking up space. And I, and, and, that's the most vulnerable. I feel like that's like what, what people got to hear, right? Like it happens. It, ha- it happens to division one players. It happens to people who, who win J you know, gold at JOs. It happens to national, ch- you know, it happens. And even when you're a starter, there's never a peak. I think for most athletes, there's never a peak where you fully feel validated unless you Ooh. decide for yourself that you're happy Ooh. and excited about what you're doing. That was no. Say say that again. <laughs> like there's never a point as an athlete that you feel like you made it until you decide that you have. So like for me, I could have like just think about it. I'm sitting on a balcony in New Jersey, you know, playing, you know, high school Jersey volleyball. Yeah. Looking at Lexi's son in this gym. And I'm like, oh, I suck. I'm playing in this gym with the same people that are mm. in this video and I suck. I'm winning championships with these people and I suck. Like, you know, like I just constantly felt like I never felt validated until I I looked back and I had I was really lucky to have people tell me like, 
hey, like you're in the gym though. There's a, a really great mm-hmm. scene from Love and Basketball. And uh, the main character, she finally gets to USC. She's playing basketball. She had a hard time getting recruited. And this one girl in the gym's really nasty. She's like, you're only here because blah, 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 got pregnant and couldn't come. And she's like, well, I'm here now. And that was my mom. We watched that one time. My mom's like, that's the, the, uh, like, that's the thing you need to have is like, okay, like, you know, whatever. You're not, you know, the top scorer on the team right now. Prep volleyball. Hmm. Prep volleyball is not writing articles about you. But you're there and you're learning and you're growing and that your time is going to come. And, and that's what I, what I learned from that experience. Um, a lot of volleyball awareness. I don't think if I hadn't gone there, I don't think I'd be at Cornell now. I don't think I'd be coaching. I don't think I'd be doing any of the stuff I did. Um, and I don't think I would have, I'm okay now when people tell me I, I suck at something. And that, that's a powerful statement that you just said and I even have a hard time when people like when people call like my wife or whatever, like if, if I get challenged or I feel like I've done less than, so to be able to be embrace, like, I don't want to say even mediocrity, but just like not where you want to be, but you know, still charging forward is like, that's, that's paramount to keep moving forward in life. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. It still sucks. I mean, now like I'm in therapy and, and things will happen and and I get upset. Like I remember drills in ball in, in Cornell now, spring drills, and I'm we're supposed to hit and I'm supposed to get up to a positive three and I'm still at two and I'm just like annoyed. I'm like and, and I start to you know, in my head I'm like, Oh my setter, like she's you know, she's setting me so tight, like I'm she's setting me into the block or my passer, like can you get it closer to the net? Like and I'm getting upset, right? And I can feel eyes on me, like, hey, Sid, you got it, like different stuff. And it takes me back to those days where I was like, where I felt like I was stinking up the gym. And I have to remember that I've, it's hard. I'm sad. I'm mad. I'm upset. I'm frustrated. I feel embarrassed. Like, I think that's what it is. Like, you feel embarrassed and you have to just go through the growth and, and point out where. What would you tell yourself you back then? Improve. Like, look, if you were able to rewind from the place you're at right now, what would you tell yourself back then? Um, I think I would tell myself kind of the, the same thing. Cause I, I think even looking back then it, it was really hard for me to listen mm-hmm. to other people that told me it would get better. Like, and actually imagine that one thing I say about sports, especially for, um, when it comes to athlete mental health is although athletes struggle with their mental health so so overwhelmingly in such hard, big numbers, like 50% of female athletes have mental health problems. That And that's of those who felt comfortable right. enough to check yes when their school sent out this way. Um, is I look back to like training and sprints and all these different things and I think about like, this mental toughness training (laughs) where like I look back at that year and I think if I hadn't run sprints until I felt like I was going to puke and then, you know, five minutes later felt fine. Like, I don't know if I would have been able to make it through that. Cause I think during that period of time, I, I genuinely just felt like you just have to get through it and move on. Like and go, I I was definitely raised with Mm -hmm. like a, a, you can't just quit mindset. And I also was definitely raised with, um, in some ways, like kind of follow the coach and be humble, right? So I was never really someone who was going to go up and speak about, oh, you're not you're not getting playing time or I don't feel like you guys are treating me fairly or whatever. Um, I, I kind of just went through this, like you have to keep pushing movement like thing. So I think that was that was what was best for me for my journey. And I think I would probably keep it that way. There's not much I would change. Over the years, I, I think I'm extremely grateful that I was able to get through that headspace and that I had support and and other outlets. And that's why I think it's really important that athletes have other outlets outside mm-hmm. of their sport. Um, but I don't think I could have really changed any of, of the advice. I think I, it was something that I had to had that, to And that's, that's a big thing to admit because, again, so many people, you know, I would go back and change this or this. And, again, I've – I've gone through things in my life. You know, I lost my mom when I was 21 and all like, and I wouldn't trade and I wouldn't go back and change it because again, where I'm at right now, where you're at right now Mm -hmm. is because of the journey that you've been on. Mm 
right? And again, it's not always sunshine yeah. and rainbows. It's not always the best thing in the world, but, and that's what, that's what's brought you and I together. And that's what's brought you to the forefront yeah. of the things that you're doing, right? And how you are trying to be that for other people and do the change and the, all of that stuff. And that, that that's where I kind of want to go next because all of this stuff happened. You wouldn't change any of it. And obviously it was tough and you went through all of these different things. And at first, I don't want to blow by the pack, fact that you're in therapy, right? I applaud you for that, right? I, since we've moved, I need to find a new therapist, yeah. but like therapy is a godsend. And I am, everybody I talk to, I continue to try yeah. to normalize it because again, to have somebody that's uh, skilled and able to talk you through whatever you may, may be going through or have gone through and it allows you to be vulnerable. It's huge. So I, I applaud you for that. Like that's then most collegiate athletes don't see yeah. the need in that. At least the ones that I've talked to or been around, let alone coaches trying to allow their uh, student athletes to do that. So I tip my cap to you for that. Um, what I do, and again, I, I want to go how, where you're at now, right? So fast forward, obviously we know you're at Cornell and we can go back if we want to f go on the recruiting journey, but I think that there's a lot more powerful stuff for us to kind of uncover and unpack. And like, and what I heard was when, if you were going back to talk to your, your younger self, you know, it's the, hey, the just keep going. It's the, the mindset, the mentality to kind of keep going in the, this part of your journey. But like, you're actually able to have some of that impact on people now. And I, I'd like, to, I'd like for you to kind of dig in on what you're doing to then make some of those changes and help other people right now. Yeah. So over the last two and a, two and a half years or so, I've been working with a company called voice and sport, which was started by our founder um, and CEO, Steph Strack, who's just an amazing woman and mentor to me. Um, and the the purpose of Voice and Sport is to bring more vis visibility to to um, girl and women athletes and to keep girls in sport. So, um, fifty like at the age of thirteen, around middle school age, fifty girls drop out of sport at a rate of fifty percent more than boys. So for every four boys that play sport, there's about two, like they're dropping out. And so, and then for, for girls of color, black girls, girls in rural or minoritized communities, that's even, even bigger. So for me as a black woman, that's super important. And I want to see black girls in sport. I think representation matters. I look at just even the opportunities that you can get out of sport and I can see how that could grow my community and uplift girls. Um, and then, just in terms of keeping girls in sport, I, I said that um, that stat statistic about um, CEOs earlier, we talk about just all of the things that you can get out of sports, whether it be a community, um, getting your body moving, being healthy, um, finding your voice, you know, maybe kind of like I did in my story, but we talk about that and that's a great thing to say. I think a mm -hmm. lot of people feel that way. Oh yeah, girls should play sports, but do at Viz is take it a step further and we say, okay, what do girls need to stay in sport? And so we looked at each thing, like why, what are the reasons girls drop out of sport? Bad mental health, that they're burnt out is one. So we have sports psychologists, experts on our platform that girls can meet with and do one-on-one -on -one or group sessions. Another one is, especially in aesthetic sports, um, but just also really big is, is body image. You know, I, I know plenty of volleyball players that have disordered eating or um, undiagnosed mm -hmm. um, um, eating disorders and, and, and even just the way that, that people talk about, about women's bodies. Um, so we have a nutrition, nutritionists and dietitians that girls can talk with, as well as college and professional athletes who have gone through those things that can talk through the girls more about the journey part. But it's also really important to us that we have experts that can give the girls you know, genuine mm -hmm. advice and give them meal plans and stuff like that. Um, we have a podcast where we have co um, collegiate and professional athletes and all some of our experts talk with staff about different it's is issues that are affecting girls. Um, and then content. All of our content is created by college 
girls, um, usually athletes who are interested in journalism or sports business, and they write articles about all of those topics, mind, health, body, journey, all of that to help girls. And we have this on our website, voiceinsport.com, and girls can access most of our things for free. And then they also have the option to pay for a couple of extra sessions or with specific people throughout the month. And the reason that a part of it is paid is also so that our college and professional athletes can get paid for, for their work and then kind of close some of that some of that gap in terms of, of athletes being compensated. There's a there's a big gap in the value of of women and men's athletes monetarily. So and That's again, what Steph and the crew and you and the crew again, like Kelsey Robinson, you know, a good friend, like she's you know doing stuff over there. Like what y'all are building is absolutely amazing. And again, my previous life with Adidas, right? We were very fortunate that I was working within volleyball, and again, volleyball is the number one female high school age team participated sport across the country, right? So raising awareness and the stats that you rattle right. off are all things that again we do, we we take to heart and we, again how we were actually able to sell you know growth and to be able to do a lot of these things because it's paramount for us to right. be able to level up around that around those female athletes so like what step what you guys are doing is amazing um and again i've been fortunate enough to talk to steph a couple times and like it's yeah. it's huge so now within viz what's what's your because again we're also going to go title nine and we're going to go that but like what like what's your role and function right now what do you like what are you doing specifically So, I mean, we have a lot of stuff going on. So um, out of like kind of what I can say, like a lot of, for me, it, it's always been about, I would say the representation and, and what we've been talking about of like, what would you say to yourself or how, you know, wishing that I had other people that had my journey when I was going through that I could watch and, and connect with. So for me, it's a lot of I've had a lot of success so far in working with Biz and different things that I've been doing. So using some of that experience to connect with other athletes that may not have easily know about us. So like recruiting college and professional athletes um, and talking with some of our sponsors um, and corporate and different corporations to help um, to uh, either donate or, or come to Viz. And so we have a lot of corporates, uh, little corporate sponsors who will actually donate memberships or membership sessions to girls in need. So girls, I mean, there's always at least one free session a month for girls. So you, there's, we try to limit that, that resource gap, um, but definitely trying to get, you know, sponsorships for that. Um, and then as I'm actually am a mentor, so talking to girls or writing articles about things, one thing that will be coming out soon is an article that I'm going to write about using um, a resource from one of our experts mm -hmm. about like, so you, so you didn't make the team, right? So like, what do girls do when they didn't make the team? How do you work through those feelings? What do you do next? How do you keep playing the sport? Because unfortunately, if you don't make the high school team or the middle school team, there isn't really a lot of resources, especially free or accessible resources to continue playing the sport. And that's a really sad thing, especially when I look at a school like like Cathedral, which is, you know, performing on a really high level, but the, that's which is great. But the sad part of that is if you, you know, it's really hard mm -hmm. to make that team. And if you don't make it, how do you get to play? Right. So we have all these really top club and, and you know, high performing girls that are taking spots on the high school team, which is great. Everyone deserves to play. But but what do you do with all with the other girls? So that's kind of what my mission is at Viz, is trying to, to grow our platform, making sure that people are having a good time on our platform, that we're growing, that we're um, providing the resources that we need. And then my next step um, has been helping to develop the advocacy yep. team, which we launched in 2021. And the idea behind the advocacy team is, okay, great. We have all of these resources for girls. You know, they're going to have, you know, hopefully better self-confidence. They're going to be comfortable in their bodies. They're going to feel like they have a plan for how they can practice. They're going to feel like they know athletes that are in the position that they want to be in. And then you look around and they don't have the resources to actually do it. So the advocacy team is all about bringing about those opportunities for the girls and making sure we're giving them what they need. So our big one has been Title IX. And we have a couple of global goals for girls and we're working through all of those. And a big one is opportunity and access. So 
for those who don't know, Title IX is a piece of legislation passed mm -hmm. 50 years ago, um, as of this summer, that says on the basis of sex, um, resources, activities can have to be equal um, among among the sex. So which most people would say female or male. At Viz, we, we try to say woman or, or, or boy or girl or boy mm -hmm. or man um, to be more inclusive. And the the big part of Title IX is there isn't really boys and girls music or boys and girls math, but there is boys and girls sports. And so that's why Title IX has been so big around sports. And a lot of schools aren't compliant. A big problem with Title IX is there's it's, a, it's only 37 words. So there's not a whole lot of rules or, or to make sure that that's happening. So we at both Viz looked at all of our advocates and we, we did um, we had everyone look at their school and do an analysis of their school and say, OK, this is where our school is lacking. And then based off those things, we looked at other schools and we created a bill. We, li we literally drafted a bill with the help of Senator Murphy and Representative Alma Adams to, f to fill some of those loopholes. So the main one would be education. Um, people don't know what Title IX is, even people in mm -hmm. schools. They don't realize everything that it requires. The next would be um, transparency and reporting. Schools aren't required to report um, what they're spending or what they're doing between in their athletic department. Um, and so, <laughs> one, saying this is what you have to report and this is what you have to be transparent about, this is where you put it, would be is honestly a basic level of, basic of transparency. Thing that, it's on, it's basic. Um, and then uh, and, and then the last one is enforcement. So even if there is, you know, the EADA, you can go on the EADA website right now and look up a college and you can look at their Title IX spending and their different expenses and different things. But there's no one enforcing it. If you go right now and you look up a school, there's a very, very high chance, unless they've recently had a lawsuit that they're following Title IX and it, nothing happens to them. They could point out right now we spend $1 million on men's teams and we spend $200 on women's and no one would do anything. So those are our three things of the bill. And uh, we've, been, we've been doing that. Yeah, I mean, and again, don't, <laughs> oh yeah, just brush it. We've been doing that, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> holy cow, right? Like you, what you and the team over there, and again, I'm going to speak to you and I tip my cap to everybody with on the advocacy team and everybody with Viz, but like, obviously you and I are in it, right? Like, for you to be able to do this, and I, I'm rewinding, call it four years ago when you moved to San Diego, right? And you're questioning all of these different things right. in volleyball and all of that stuff. And then here you are, and don't downplay it, right? Like you can tell who you, I want you to tell our listeners who you've talked to and what you've done. And like, because again, four years ago to now, it's the same person, but it's somebody that mm -hmm. is, has this purpose and this drive and this comfortability in your own skin. And like, it, like I, I'm like taken aback in a good way, because again, the evolution of you as a female, as a strong black female, and this is, this is amazing. I'm grateful to be able to even give you, like provide a platform for you to be able to share this even more, because again, what you've done, I don't think many people know or understand. So I want to make sure that we're we're selling selling and celebrating you to the best of our ability. Uh, sure. So I guess a little bit more about the bill. Um, that all started with, like I said, okay. Well, what is actually preventing girls from mm -hmm. from being able to use all these resources that that we're able to provide and, and that they're looking for. Um, and then it goes, okay, these are the things, these are what's wrong with Title IX. And, and there's so much more mm -hmm. that's keeping girls from being able to do it. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was, at, I was at an event in Miami on a panel and a girl raised her hand in the Q&A and she asked, uh, this is getting a little off topic, but she asked, hey, you know, I love basketball. And, but, you know, girls really, you don't really get any respect out of playing that's one second. I can close this. You're good. Is it loud? I can hear a little bit. You're good. Oh. Okay. Um, and she's like, my girl, she goes, hey, you know, I love playing basketball. It's so much fun. Like, I want to play in high school. Um, and maybe I want to play, you know, AAU or club. 
but girls really don't get any respect when they play basketball and like there's nowhere there's nothing I can do with it mm. she's like it's not like the NBA where I can make a whole bunch of money I feel like I should take my time and use my resources to do something that would better my future wow and I was like no <laughs> I felt horrible and and the thing is people think that oh, like we don't have a women's team or, oh, the women's team doesn't get new, you know, the men's team gets new jerseys every year. Women's get it every five years. Men's teams get, you know, sparklers during their games. Women's team maybe get an announcer. Men's teams get advertised, you know, on, on the on the teleprompter in the announcements, oh, men's game at seven, but there, there's a women's game at five. And that's part of Title IX. All of these things are part of Title IX and people don't realize that. And the messaging it's sending to girls is that, oh, my dream doesn't matter. It's impractical. Mm. And it's not, and for me, it's not so much that, oh, your dream's impractical, like someone might say about a musician or an artist. It's your dream's impractical because you're a girl. Right? So it's like Mm. your dream's impractical because you're a girl. You want to play basketball at a high level. That'd be fine if you were a guy. Because you're a girl, it doesn't matter. It's not going to happen. And that's so sad for, for the earlier generation because now that girl, she's missing out on all of that community and the discipline and the humility and, and the confidence and all of that that she gets that you get out of sport. And she's not even she's not even in high school yet. She's thinking about if she should try out for the team. And so that's that's the impact of Title IX. And these are the kinds of things that we we said on our Capitol Hill days as we tried to find representatives, um, Senator and from the House that that would sponsor our bill. And and so when we announced our bill, we went to DC on in June and we announced the bill on June 23rd, 2022, which is the 50th anniversary of Title IX. We announced the Fair Play for Women Act of 22, 2022. That's the name of our bill. We did it in the Russell Senate office building. Um, and we invited a bunch of girls in the area, the the George George Washington basketball team, um, Howard women's volleyball. I don't want to miss anyone. I'm sorry if you came in and, and I don't remember your full team, but a, a bunch of teams and a bunch of girls came out literally to the Senate building to be there among uh, Congress people to, to support the bill. And we had a panel with some really amazing, amazing people in the industry. Um, and and that's how we celebrated Title IX by saying, yes, it's been amazing and you've given amazing opportunities to women. People like my mom were able to go to college without debt because of it and were able to become mm. chemical engineers and all these different things. But we also are dropping the ball and we want to push for more. And that's this. It's celebrating women athletes. It's writing those articles and, and, and showing people like Allison Felix who joined our team that. and all of that. And then And then saying, okay, and we want more. Uh, Deloitte posted like a couple of years ago a study that the sports industry is missing out on billions of dollars a year by not not highlighting women's athletics the way they do. I think the the Euro Cup, like last week, had is the most watched football game, soccer game in, in the United Kingdom. The most watched, not women's, not men's most ever. Watched. Yep. That's proof right there. So whether you care about women's sports or not. If you're going to even just look at an industry perspective, you're missing out on billions of dollars. You're you know, you're spot on on that. And again, I my my industry experience comes back, you know, from Adidas, right? And where I was doing sports marketing and partnership management. But like, we were one of the only we, the fact that we had a women's volleyball shoe, but yet up until um, I think this year, I just saw that they just started doing a women's basketball shoe that wasn't a takedown yeah. of a men's shoe and it was done on the men's last. Like we right. were fortunate again, my boss, when I was working at Adidas, Christine Shelby, like she had a, a very great mindset. Right? Like, look, she played, we're building this for her, you know, this, and, but yet that's not necessarily the case. Right. And again, it's the old adage, the shrink it and pink it. That'll be okay for them. And da, da, da. like, no. And that's, you're holding other industries and other people accountable around it and calling, making awareness around it. Like, is yeah. huge because guess what? And I'm, I'm not going to be naive to the fact that there is profitability around it and you're doing the right thing by doing it and calling awareness around it. But yeah, companies like, Oh, you know, is there, are you paying attention? And that's the, like that, that's exactly what you guys are calling to light. Just pay attention. What you said was, and I heard 
you said celebrate. We're celebrating everything that's happened, but you know, like what I hear is you're celebrating and you're elevating, right? Like that's the thing that Viz is doing, right? Like, hey, we're celebrating all this stuff that has happened and has gotten us to this point, but we got to find a way to elevate it, and we've got to find a way to take it to the next level to make it aware and just do all of this stuff. Right. Yeah. And, and I think the coolest part about the advocacy program is um, we're we're shooting for high school and college girls. Any 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 athlete, and, and honestly, if you really care about sports, you know you know a decent amount. Like if you're interested, send us an email. Apply on our website, and and, and we want to have an advocate every athletic department in the country, mm. high school and college. We want to have one everywhere. We want them to know Title IX. We want them to know their rights. We want them to be keeping their teams accountable. And it's sad because these athletic departments should be accountable anyway, but. Uh, one thing that I say and that I was taught, I brought my grandma up earlier, is the best way to make sure that you're not being taken advantage of is to learn your rights, to know when you are being taken advantage of. And then that second part is being able to speak and, and using your voice. I think I got a lot of that from Biz, and I think it started in volleyball. It started with me feeling like, oh, my experience doesn't matter, <laughs> right? It started with feeling like, oh, you know, I it could be so easy for for a girl to say like oh well i'm not division one i'm not an olympian i can't why like they don't even play a wnba games on on prime mm -hmm. time like why would i complain to my principal that they don't you know announce that our game's at 5 p.m right it's so easy for that but when you tell the girls and you give them opportunities to to, to use their voice and tell them that it matters awesome things happen we have some really really awesome high school and even younger girls that are posting and creating chapters at their school and talking to people about this and 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 talking about sports and pointing things out and that was a really hard thing when we started biz was getting girls involved mm -hmm. people who felt comfortable speaking out against what's happening and it's really common for girls it's really common for for um the black community for a lot of communities to say, well, we have this much. Why would we push for more? You know, at least we have mm -hmm. this. Girls will say, at least we have a locker room. At least we have a team. At least we get to play, you know, and, instead of asking for more. That's it, it, it's super like powerful because, again, what you're saying is people don't know about it and people are don't see if we're going back to like your role models, right? You mentioned Lisa Leslie, Don Staley, your mom, all these people, right? Like, and again, I look at the volleyball community, right? Like, how can we connect dots to people within the volleyball community, particularly strong females that can help lead this charge? Because again, most of these high school aged athletes, these club athletes don't see this. I mean, again, and I'm not, I've said this before, heck, most of these people, most of these uh, club athletes don't even know who the hell's on the national team, right? So again, as a sport, right? Like, I don't think that we do a great job. And I know USA Volleyball and other organizations are trying to elevate that and make that more, but like, if you don't know who's playing it at the highest level possible, how the hell are they supposed to know who's out there, like people like you that are making a difference and trying to be advocates for change and trying to make it better for that person that's 12, mm -hmm. 13, 14 years old. So like that falls on like people like myself, right? And people within the volleyball community to be able to help spread the word, be like, look, we know that this is where we want to go. And this is, we need strong females leading this charge. Hey, how do we point them in the right direction? So like for me, I'm sitting there going, okay, as my head's going, not to do, go away from our conversation and not that I haven't been listening, but I feel called to action, right? Like, okay, I've got to talk to you and I got to talk to Steph to make sure I've got the right information for post podcast whenever we go into this. So that way we can drive as much traffic to Viz and to people like you to raise awareness, right? How, like those are things that I sit and think about because again, I'm a, I'm a dad, like my daughter is going to be six, right? If I'm not doing something, she's going to be dealing with the same stuff that you've gone through and people before have gone through. And if we're not making change and rallying people around change, like, then what the hell are we doing? Yeah. And that's one thing we call, um, we've been calling to action too, is like a lot of people and like, it's amazing. You, you're, you have a daughter and you know, okay, I want this for my daughter. It's like, and this isn't a slide to you, as we say to people, you know, you don't have to just right. have a daughter to care, right? Right? Or your wife doesn't have to be an Olympian for you to cheer on and to go to, to Wimbledon or whatever. 
and, and and so it's a lot of that, like reaching out. The male athletes that do have the platform too. I, I look at there's posts and you get a middle school boy texting you or whatever, posting like, would you want $1 or a ticket to a WNBA game? And my response is, well, first of all, <laughs> if you take a dollar over a ticket, you're not yeah, I was going to say entrepreneurial, you're not you thinking. <laughs> at least take like $45, even if you don't want to go to the game. And second of all, it's like, they're learning this, like, who are they idolizing? It's those male players. It's those NBA players, these other people. So it's been really awesome now seeing some of these players going to WNBA games and wearing the merch and all these different things and supporting, you know, Patrick, uh, uh, Patrick Mahomes, his wife um, owns uh, one of the NWSL teams, like, but just seeing seeing athletes um, rally around why why is it cool to make fun of the WNBA? yeah it's yeah it right and it's not encouraged or it's not commented on it just allows to well but you continue. talked about it too right yeah i mean it comes around to mainstream media it comes around to you know what what we're pushing out there and what's getting consumed i mean again i'll speak volleyball right mm-hmm. like i mean the now the semifinals and the national championships are some of the most viewed female sporting events in ncaa each year but yet you know we get it's like pulling teeth to get on espn maybe it's on espn too but da, 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 but that's the only time you're ever really seeing it you might see it on you'll see it on espn you like all of those things and i uh i appreciate you kind of challenging me around the the daughter thing right because again the fortunate thing is i've always been connected to the sport and to the female athlete right having been a coach and that's uh, and I absolutely right. love it. So the fortunate thing is I've had this mindset, you know, even before my wife and I had our daughter, this is just, I guess, another arrow in the quiver or what, some st- whatever stupid metaphor that I wanted to just use. I don't even know, where, but like, it's just another reason for me to be like, okay, hey, yeah, I've got the passion. I know this, but like, we need to keep going, not only for Harper, my daughter, but for uh-huh. for Sydney who may have not had that advocate when right. she was 14 or for this or for the, like, so like all of this is, uh, it blows my mind. And the cool, like, I don't want to brush over the fact that because of all the awesome stuff you've done, you recently got honored too, like a big time, a big time honor. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it was. Yeah. I mean, hard, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just got to live. There's a moment of uncomfortability here because I, I pivoted to, to celebrating you and I, I but, but that, but that's part of it too, because if we're not celebrating the work happening and all of the good things and calling out that, it's just as bad as not putting it on TV or anything. So, like, I want to make sure that you have your moment to share, and I know you're going to downplay it, but like your honor and what just recently happened to you. Yeah. So last last month in July, I was honored with with an SB the. Billie Jean King Youth Leadership Award um, for for my work um, with with Voice and Sport and Title IX and and, and then they also put an um, an aspect of it on your work in your community. So they definitely um, Voice and Sport and 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 the Title IX legislation and all of that we've been doing, um, and then also just some of the stuff I've been doing at Cornell. We have a Women of Color. Um, athletics group that I was just elected president for. And, and that's really the similar vision of Viz with just an extra emphasis on women of color and that experience. A lot of the girls in that group um, are the only person of color on their team. So that's a really cool way to, to grow the athletic community and just create another layer of community there. Um, and, and, and that it was really awesome. And just, a part of the Billie Jean King Youth Leadership Award is, um, you know, being flown out to the SBs and, and participating in all of those events, but also being able to meet um, Billie Jean King. You know, she's the famous battle of the sexes is something that really sparked, you know, Title IX and a lot of these conversations on equal pay and disability of women athletes. Um, and then also meeting some really awesome, amazing women. So usually she um, honors um, an even mix of 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 women and men, but this year to celebrate Title IX, she did it five women, and, and some of those those women were awesome. Um, 
Nor one of one of the women she um, she ran she runs a, a, a campaign called uh, Let Nor Run. She was disqualified um, in 2019, I believe, for wearing her hijab during a track meet in Ohio. In Ohio. Mm-hmm. One of the other girls, Lucy, um, she uh, was the fir- the youngest woman to climb Mount Everest. Um, another girl, Alicia, she runs a program called Wrestle Like a Girl. She's a female wrestler, um, which I, I had never, I didn't know girls wrestled, right. so that was cool for me. And then one of the other girls, Kendall, she does something similar to this with mentoring girls and giving girls opportunities to play sports. So that was also a really awesome opportunity to be able to network and, and learn from people who are also running really amazing organizations. Um, I would say the coolest thing for me about winning an ESPY is when I look at my journey in sport, when I look at my journey as volleyball, right, you see ESPY, you see Sydney Moore, you see voice in sport, you say Cornell women's volleyball. So you say, oh, she's D1. Like, oh, she was one because she's like just so good at volleyball. And she like got a really awesome kill or something. And and I, I am good at volleyball, but I won an S because of who I am as a person. And I won because of my journey and the work that I'm doing. And that was so impactful. And I hope that's not lost on people. Um, I never would have thought that I would be Oscar, uh, you know, honored at, at the ESPYs. I never thought that would be an award that I would get because – I'm confident in my ability as an athlete, but I'm not a one percenter, right? I'm not on the, I'm not an Olympian, mm-hmm. right? Like, I'm not Allison Felix, you know. I, I'm not, you know, these different people who are these amazing athletes, and many of them are also amazing people and, and are running great programs. But it was just, it was a surreal moment for me, um, and it's something that I really want to make sure that the girls that I work with, that I coach, that I mentor, all of that get, which is that what we've been talking about, that your experience in sport matters no matter what it is, right? So whether you, you played in middle school for a couple of years and you just got, you had some fun and you realized it wasn't your thing, fine. If you played for years and you, you made your way and you won a national championship and you were an Olympian, great. If you, you know, you played in high school and you helped pass a bill for Title IX, great. Like there's so many avenues in sport and so just making sure that you're getting that opportunity and that the opportunity is, is as positive as possible is so super, super important to me because it, it defined my life, right? It defined my mother. It defined me. Like it defines a lot of my friendships are from athletes, you know, or, or people mm-hmm. who are active, right? So there's just, there's so much to it. Yeah. I'm at a loss for words because there's nothing more powerful. Like there's nothing else that I can say or do better than what you just articulated and what, like the message that you're trying to bring across. And like, that's, we need more people in the world like you. And like, I want to make sure that you understand, like for me, and I always do this at the end of a podcast and I, I feel like we're coming to a point to where we can kind of start wrapping up, but like, I want you to know that I personally, and again, I can only speak for myself, but I'm grateful for what you've done. And I'm grateful for your journey along the way, because as we, as you've said, and we've kind of been, we've said multiple times, right? Like your journey is unique to you and it's been full of ups and downs. Mm -hmm. It's, it's had hard times when you moved and when you were questioning your identity and doing all this stuff and you had darkness and to the person that you are right now and the journey that you're on, that you kept going, because that's something that I wrote down, right? Like, just keep going. That's somebody else that I work with. That's kind of her mantra. You know, just keep going. You're, you mm-hmm. are where you are because of all this stuff you've been through. And you are making a difference in this world. One conversation, one interaction, one, one day at a time. And the world is better because you're in it. Now, I like, I say that and I don't like, that's not me fluffing. Like I truly believe that the world is a better place and that you are making a difference because you are here. And I'm thankful that you are, and I'm thankful that you keep putting in the work and you keep moving forward. Thank you. I'm, I'm so happy that I, I get to be on the podcast and even you just doing your stories like this isn't something that people would hear about without you and so many of the stories that you've shared like i'll say even just the one with my coach matt like changed my perspective and my um 
my excitement for the season and me wanting to be a better player for this next year because I know who Matt is as a coach, right? And because I know about, you know, all of all of your different your guests and how vulnerable you are on the podcast. It makes it easy to to tell your story and it makes you comfortable that's, to share. And I so. think I you thank you for that. And again, I guess that's why I kind of why I had the desire and why I started this, right? Because again, and I say everybody's everybody's on a journey, everybody's got a story. And I'm just I'm fortunate enough to where I've got mm -hmm. a I think I've got a unique skill set to where I can sit and listen and have conversation because I, I like I love this stuff. I love being able to be the megaphone and the microphone for somebody else because like we said at the beginning, if we can help one person along the way, right? Like I feel like that's part of my purpose and that's part of and that's exactly what you're doing, right? You're living mm -hmm. your purpose. So I appreciate the kind words and again it's however I can continue to support you and Viz and all that stuff. We'll uh, we will do that and we'll we'll go offline after the fact. And like I said, if we need to connect with stuff and how whatever it looks like, that's great. Um, before I kind of roll into my last question, which I know you already know what it is, but we'll, we'll get to that. But like, how can our listeners connect with you? Because again, we'll throw this on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, and we'll also throw it on YouTube. But like, how can our listeners get know what you're up to and then also get involved in your kind of call to actions? Sure. I would say the best way is Instagram. It's uh, sydney.more, two S's, two M's, because there's like a thousand people named Sydney Moore <laughs> in the world. Uh, so Instagram would be it. That's where I'm mostly posting. I, I try not to do the other social media as much, I'm trying. Um, so, and then the next would be following Voice and Sport on Instagram and checking out there. I think we have a lot of just really easily digestible content on there. And then checking out our website, voiceandsport.com. If you're a girl age like 13 to 23, you should be able to sign up, no problem. We try to keep that community small, so you do have to apply. But, you know, just apply, you know, tell us maybe what sport you play or what you're interested in, and we'll see you on the platform. And if you'd like to, you can sign up for a mentorship session with me specifically from our community. Just search me, uh, search my name in that community area, and we can talk and chat or whatever. And then otherwise, just look out for our content, listen to our podcast, and uh, just keep seeing what we're doing next. I love it. And we'll link all it. of it in the show notes and all, you know, in all the in, in Instagram and all that stuff. So that way everybody can find it. And again, if, if that's too much and somebody, if you're listening and want to reach out to me directly, I'll help connect dots, you know, however I can as well. Um, because again, this is, this isn't going away, right? We need to be louder. We need to be able to do a lot more of this and, you know, we're lucky to have people like Sydney and Steph and the Viz crew and every, and again, that's there. You guys aren't the only ones doing it. Right. So like, that's the cool thing is the more that we're right. able to create a movement and talk about it, the more other things pop up and the more other people start talking about it and we're elevating everything. I dig it. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you, you feel called to share? Or like, I mean, again, cause I'll give you kind of your last moment of opportunity before I, before I hit you with the hard one. Um, I would say to be open to trying things. I would say all, all of the, the things that have happened, the more, like the big things that have happened have all been from a series of small decisions. And most of those are vulnerability and just saying yes. So I already play basketball. I'm feeling pretty confident. Someone invited me to open the gym. Yes. Right. Like, uh, you know, Hey, Sydney, we're Cornell. Do you want to go on an official mm -hmm. visit? Yes. Right. Like, you know, and, and even things in my more personal life outside of athletics, just taking a chance, t taking a chance, a, an educated chance <laughs> and, and trying new things out. It, it can really change your life. And the worst thing that happens is you, you don't, you know, if it's an educated guess, the worst thing that happens is you don't like it and you move on. I love that. But I, I, I can't imagine if I said no to the first time getting reached out to by this or saying, you know, hey, I already have schools in mind and not going to Cornell or not playing volleyball. There, there's so many different ways. Those are, those are powerful words to live by, right? I mean, again, we talk, people talk growth mindset. We talk about being open. And again, the way that I, I look at it, it was, again, we're on this journey. And if you saying yes takes you a step forward, then keep moving forward, right? It just it, maybe it means you're going on a different path. So mm -hmm. like, I love that. I right. love that. Okay. Sydney, are you ready for the the tough question? This has been the hardest 
it's like, you but know it's, it's not coming. hard because but again, I- this ties back to identity. It ties back to all these things, right? Like if you're telling somebody you get introduced and somebody, somebody asks you the question, who is Sydney Moore? How are you answering that? Uh, well, I guess I would say, mm, I, I'm Sydney Moore. When I think of my roles, I'm a, I'm a friend, I'm a daughter, I'm a granddaughter, I'm a cousin, right? I'm all of those things. I would say I'm a mentor and a teammate. I'm a player. And, and then I would say, I'm, and I'm still figuring out who I am. I don't completely know yet. And, uh, I think that's some of the beauty. It's terrifying, but it's also some of the beauty. It's still figuring out who I am. I had a teacher that used to have that on his board every day. Who am I? Where am I? And I always thought Mm. that was really interesting, especially the where am I? That's profound. And the where am I, what comes up for me, not that you asked me, but it really, I feel compelled to share. And that's what I've been trying to do more of is where am I? It's where my feet are. Because... Mm-hmm. It's so easy, like you said, to be thinking six months, 18 months, four years down the road, what we're creating. Mm-hmm. But if you can be where your feet are, that's where you're meant to be in this moment. And then we need to keep moving forward like you've advised everybody. So I love it. Like, I absolutely love it. And your answer is phenomenal because it's uniquely you. Thank you. You aced it. I, aced I mean, it. again, there's no great, there's no great on it. You could have said that you were, I mean, you could have said something that was completely and totally different. It, it's okay. Right. It's your, it's your response. So yeah. I love it. Um, so as we're close, I'll, again, I thank you. I'm truly grateful for you being here and sharing your vision, your story and everywhere you're in, where you're going and we'll link everything. And, uh, yeah, I appreciate you taking time. We got to work on that window air conditioner for you, so that way you you cool off. But uh, yeah. I'm sure that we will be in touch soon, and I'll be. Uh, I won't need it. What's that? I said in a couple months I won't need it. I'll need. I'll be turning up my heater. <laughs> Good old Ithaca. <laughs> well, on that note, right? Like I'll let you go, yeah. do what you need to do, finish up the day. But I appreciate your time, and uh, as always, thank you, Sydney. I appreciate it. Sydney's accomplished many things in this life, and I know that she's not even close to being done. If you'd like to learn more about how you can make a difference in the space of women and Title IX in sports, you can hop over to viz at voiceinsport.com and see where you can use your voice to make an impact. What were your takeaways? What were you left with? Let me know over on my Instagram at Steve Wenzel, S-T-E-V-E, V-E-N-C-L on the post for this episode. Additionally, please share this with someone who may benefit from hearing these words. That's what it's about, sharing people's stories and understanding how to keep moving forward. Thanks for listening. Please like, subscribe, and comment. And until next time, keep moving forward, even if it is just one small step at a time.